Again, I apologize for the uh, slight delay there and uh, being called there for votes. That's the nature of the beast, I guess. Uh, and again, thank you for your, your testimony, Mr. Williams and Mr. Herr. Uh, let me ask, uh, you touched on early, early on, Mr. Williams, a, an issue that we've been discussing uh, with previous panels regarding the, the request uh, in H.R. 22 for uh, relief from the current uh, uh, contribution plan uh, into the trust. And uh, I'm interested in this idea that you've proposed about instead of going with the eight-year plan as had been envisioned by Mr. Potter and, and others, uh, looking at a two-year window and then I believe reassessing at that point. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit? I think it, it has some value. I, I haven't heard the other argument about mm -hmm. why we shouldn't do that, but uh, if you could. Actually, we're fortunate enough to have GAO, and that was their uh, that was their proposal to, to, to either stop or pause after the two years. So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Hur to. Mr. Williams, you did mention it, though, right? Uh, we did not. No, you did not. Okay, Mr. Hur, I'm sorry. Yes, that, okay. that, that's fine. No problem. All right. Uh, the well, the reason I, gi I give you great credit, then. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It's it's uh, the the reason that we think that uh, that it's important to do the two years is one, we recognize that immediate financial relief is warranted. We think, given the financial situation the Postal Service is in, the uh, the amount that would be covered would be two billion and two point three billion next year. So we think that would uh, help them overcome the short the cash shortfall that they're anticipating for this year. Uh, but we also think, over the longer term, it's important to ensure the sustainability of the fund to ensure that those retirees and their families are covered. Okay. When you have that hit, to have some certainty that that benefit will be there for them. The the thought behind the two-year idea that we're, we're sympathetic to is that it provides also the Congress with the opportunity to come back, take a look at this in two years, to see whether or not the Postal Service has made the kind of changes that are needed to help it become, you know, th really thinking about its business model and becoming more financially sustainable. So that keeps your option open to come back, see whether or not you'd want to do this again, to provide two more, or you'd go out for the additional eight. It doesn't forego that. It just simply gives you more options in terms of policy. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to go back and forth a couple of times with that, that idea, back to the proponents, and, and see where we come out here. Uh, let me jump to another issue, which is the, uh, the housing relocation. Mr. Williams, uh, you know, we, we did have uh, a couple of stories in the press. I know one by CNN about uh, somewhat exorbitant prices being paid uh, for relocation of, of uh, Postal Service employees. Uh, a fairly large amount. It looked like over a hundred million in 2007, 2008 for relocation purposes and for for uh, uh, employee reimbursements. I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, have you looked at, at at this issue in particular? We we have just received. Uh, I actually, when the CNN first broke the story, we uh, began. Senator Grassley called us, and we b we uh, worked out a request for a, an audit of the area, and we've commenced the audit, and then Senator Collins joined the request and expanded on its parameters a bit. So we've just begun looking at that specific issue, we and we were very pleased to work with your staff as well and, and have at least uh, had discussions about it. We're, we're trying to look at the instant case, our and we're trying to find other cases like it, and then we're trying to look at best practices employed by others. and. Um, we hope to, to in a timely fashion, provide uh, light on it in time for this, this look that uh, Chairman Gallagher referred to in, in hopes that we can affect its, uh, its outcome and make sure that we inform the debate on both sides and, and allowed enough information to be present to, to alter the policies. Okay. Uh, I just want to, if it, if it helps, we would make a formal request to join uh, with with Senator Grassley and Collins uh, as as a uh, uh, a House uh, entity interested in that issue, so whatever requires whatever is required of us to get involved in, and included in that loop on information, uh, the committee would greatly appreciate it. Uh, at this point, I'd like to yield to my my colleague, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah, for thank five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, had uh, questions about the relocation assistance policy, so it's good to know that, uh, that you're moving forward on that. 
Uh, uh, Mr. Williams, I, uh, can you give us any insight and co confirmation that there is indeed uh, an investigation in regarding uh, Mr. Potter specifically as it relates to this uh, possible sweetheart deal that he got from Countrywide? There's a very broad-based investigation going on involving Countrywide uh, being conducted by the United States Attorney's Office. It's in early stages, and we are cooperating because of the incident that, that you, you uh, explored and, and reported on uh, earlier. You know, we've done as much work as we can until um, records begin to, to arrive uh, in response to a subpoena that was uh, issued by the Department of Justice. They're, they're mostly concerned with uh, instances where there was a clear quid pro quo, and there, but there are going to be ins there are other loans, in including the one uh, that that you met you brought up and discussed with um, the Postmaster General, that are that also need to be examined and light needs to be shed on those. So is that so something you'll specifically be looking into? I, I we, we are. It's under the direction of the larger investigation. Okay. And that also is going to dictate a bit of the pace of it. But knowing of your interest, of course, we're going to make you aware okay. of that. Thank you. I appreciate so that. Um, my understanding is, and I want to see if uh, you're aware of the two postal employees in Elkridge that were recently arrested for stealing more than $600,000 in stamps and selling them on, on eBay. Um, do you have any reason to believe that this is a widespread problem? And do you have any other light on this specific instance? That's a very large instance. There, there are, there have been other instances um, mm. of both uh, the theft and diversion of, of uh, postage. It's postage and cash, are, are of course, are uh, commonly dealt with, and they can also be concealed. They can be moved from machine to machine, and and it. it the Postal Service has a very good policy of how to keep track of that and close out timely, but policies aren't always followed. And in this instance, that's that's precisely what happened. It's been a long time since those have been audited. When they when they were audited, we we uh, confirmed that the large the losses were were quite large. Are there mechanisms, I guess, being put in place to deal with it so that it doesn't happen even on a small scale? They're they're trying, they're doing their best to. Uh, to assure that the policies that are in place for accountability and rapid closeouts are being conf are okay. being confirmed right. with. Uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Her. Uh, this idea of uh, two years versus eight years. I just want to mm. explain. Uh, it, would that give them sufficient time in order to maybe develop a more long-term plan? Is I think that would be one of the benefits you could see. I mean, as I mentioned in my oral statement, we think that what, what that would also it would allow Congress to keep an eye on how things are evolving in terms of the financial situation. One thing I'd, I'd like to point out about the, how the payments are structured over the eight years, they start off at two, two billion, but then by 2016, they actually go up to 4.2. So uh, much of the relief is front loaded, if you will. So that two-year period would allow Congress to look for a plan, look for what some of the options would be going forward. And we outlined some of those in uh, my testimony as well. Uh, very good. La last thing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, going back to the President's commission that uh, was executed a couple years ago, this idea of a postal network optimization committee to look at the closing of uh, facilities, is, is that something you've taken an opinion on or have want to state opinion on? Uh, it's something I think in the past that's come up previously. Uh, you, I think part of it would be a question of how something like that were to be, would be structured. Uh, obviously, closing postal facilities anywhere is, is an issue that uh, is difficult uh, for the service, I think partly because of interest from a number of different parties. So it may be important to Do provide. Do you see anything formally underway at all? Not that I'm aware of, no, sir. There's, uh, a, there's a I'm go I'm ahead, sorry, please. Yeah. There's a great deal of activity with regard to examining the the uh, possible combinations and reduction of this oversized network that we have. So, um, but it's not a national effort. There's a great deal happening at the local level, and then the the, the job of the national effort is to make sure that the big movement uh, highways that the mail move on and so forth are not disrupted by local decisions. Um, but there have been there have been a lot of closures already. The there have been 60 airmail centers and 52 annexes, 10 remote encoding centers. There have been 10 of these successful local efforts. There are 16 on the horizon now, 
and deeper into the process, there, there are the beginnings of as many as 40 more. That's, a, that's another way of, of um, engaging in this without a BRAC type of effort, but the BRAC type of effort does have, does have merit. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Williams, uh, I don't know if you're here for the testimony of, uh, of uh, Post Postmaster General Potter and, and of uh, Ms. Gallagher, who was formerly on the Compensation Committee. In, in looking at the, the framework that, that the Compensation Committee uses to, to determine the CEO's salary here for the Postmaster General, uh, there seem to be a couple of balancing statutes. One is uh, a statute that I believe 2006 requires the salary to sort of be pegged to the vice president's salary. 120 percent of that is a maximum. And then there's another part of the statute, I believe uh, it might have been PAEA, uh, that says the salaries to the degree possible should be comparable to private sector. Those, those seem to be, at least in this case, at odds. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of the, the process they used in arriving at this salary and then applying the bonus uh, and, and the whole package, did, did, did the compensation committee operate within the frame, the, I think, legitimate framework? I know they had the same struggle in terms of the testimony of Ms. Gallagher. She said they sort of struggled with the two statutes and, you know, perhaps it's, uh, it's Congress's fault for, for entering into uh, an area of, of considerable ambiguity in, in the statute, trying to get people to follow two directions that, that are necessarily are not going in the same direction. But uh, your own opinion of, of the job they did. Some clarity with regard to the to the two uh, references and, and the two directions would be would be useful. I uh, I know that what we tried to do with when we became aware that that uh, deferred compensation had been paid, we we tried to work with both your staff and then we also worked on the Senate side to try to draw together all of the legal references and assure that there was a legal basis for both the bonuses, and then for the for the usage of defer deferred uh, compensation, which I was not familiar with. We worked with OPM as well, and they're telling us that this, this, um, this situation that occurred here was the one for which their opinions had been um, formulated, that if, a salary that if a salary and a bonus goes over the cap, whatever that cap is, that it, it may be paid in deferred payments. And then we asked them, had it ever been done? Mm -hmm. because we in my knowledge, we'd driven off the map at that point. They said 23 departments had done it, and there were 81 individuals that had been um, um, given deferred deferred uh, payments for this. There, there does seem to be a leg legal basis for both of those, for for the uh, the bonuses, and you you gave some of the citations. They're a bit fragmented, and there are a number of them. And then for the deferred payment, we rely upon. Title V and OPM. Actually, GAO has done some um, legal opinions with regard to abuses of deferred compensation, and it does not appear that what happened here. L is let me just sort of refine my question a little bit then. Mm -hmm. The deferred compensation aspect of this you have a, a current year cap, and it seems to me that uh, they exceeded that cap by putting the money into the next year, or not necessarily the next year, but future years. It, it, it looked to me, as someone who, you know, worked for 20 years for, for a fixed wage per hour, it seemed to be a way of getting around the cap by putting the money in other years, which I thought, at least at first blush, uh, contravened the intent of Congress in, in putting in a yearly cap. Mm -hmm. uh, am, I, am I wrong on this, or, or how? how 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 usual is this? Uh, is it a function of Mr. Potter, using his example, has been an employee for 31 years, and so obviously over the, those years, and these are these are his later latest years, you know, 30 going into year 31. Obviously, he's built up some value in his his pension fund, and uh, I guess what I'm asking is it a function of that that he's in the latter years of a long long length of service? 
uh, in the post office, and now his, his uh, you know, what he's got there, the, the uh, corpus of his retirement is, is, is compounding rapidly now because he's at the end of his career. Is that it, or was there a conscious decision by the Compensation Committee to inject something, make a contribu contribution into something that actually exceeded the statutory cap? The deferred payments um, were not a result of, his, of the accrual and increasing in, in value of his pension as far as we could determine. It looked as though that, that uh, they, they uh, arrived at his salary and they did use consultants to do that as, the, as Chairman Gallagher said. And then they, then they had the two uh, bonuses, the one for the PFP and then the one for the contract that Governor Gallagher was describing. Those, those went over the cap, and so it defaulted to this OPM decision and process for when that happens, and that is to pay it in the next year for which um, you are eligible and have not reached the cap. So in most instances, what that means is after retirement, and, and that's in all likelihood that's what's going to occur with regard to, uh, mm. to the Postmaster General. So it, w it was the bonus. Yeah, it's a decision. windfall then. I'm sorry, sir. It was a windfall. Uh, I'm not sure if that's precisely the word uh, well, I would have used. They, they yeah, knew okay. that it, they'd gone over the cap, and okay. then, it, then they defaulted to the direction of OPM, and that, and that was the applicable statute. All right, I'm sure I've exceeded my time limit. Why don't I yield to yes, yield time? Well, let me ask you. Uh, what would you? What would you? Uh, suggest as a remedy. Uh, we can't have this situation where uh, you have a cap. I mean, do you think it would be uh, worthwhile for Congress to consider clarification of the statute and, and then, you know, cap everything, plug these holes and address that whole, you know, year-to-year -year deferment situation? Uh, I have not, because my jurisdiction sort of ends at the postal boundary, I have not found out what caused OPM to develop this system of deferred payments. I, that would be a good thing to, to learn and to discover. We, we have some idea, but we d I'd like to have a much better understanding of that. And it certainly isn't, the only reason that we're having this committee examine this is because it was disclosed by the Postal Service. Apparently it's happened in 81 instances in 23 departments. This is a very large issue, and I don't understand why it was created. I okay. It, it could have some merit, but I just don't know of its origin. All right, that's a fair answer, and, and uh, if you're the Inspector General and you don't know, uh, then, then we, all, we all have a problem. Uh, and I, and I'm, I'm sure you are being very diligent on, on the issue. Maybe it's something the committee needs to look at separately and apart from this one instance uh, that might be clouded, uh, you know, because we keep referring to, to Mr. Potter, maybe it's better to look at it as a sort of a, a statutory uh, uh, issue, take the personal politics out of it. Uh, Mr. Potter indicated that he thought the only way back to viability is really through mail volume, increase in mail volume. Uh, Technology does not support that trend, however, with the use of emails and and uh, folks, uh, you know, paying their bills online is becoming, you know, as as the computer savvy generation gets a little bit older, you know, it's usually old folks like me that use the, you know, that use the uh, the mail for for paying their bills, and so I don't see that situation getting any better. Uh, do you think the, the facts out there and, and the trends support Mr. Potter's uh, assumption that things can get better on that end and that, that we can balance, uh, you know, we can get this system back into viability on, on volume? I, I'm not sure all the mail is going to come back when, when the good times return. I, I do believe that uh, the, end of the, the end of this crisis is going to come and that some of the mail will return. I think uh, a better option are, are the ones that, uh, that Mr. Davis and Ms. Norton were talking about, a, a new model and a new plan. There are a lot of options for viability out there for us. 
I think it's going to be a very different type of postal service when we come out of this. Actually, shipping probably has a brighter future, and certain kinds of mail are going to become very important. And we can probably migrate into things such as saturation or our neighborhood mail in a way that we have not in the past. Um, very, very, I, as I imagine the future, very powerful sort of first mile, last mile alliances with the, uh, the competition would, would have all kinds of benefits. They, it would be financially rewarding. And then at the same time, it would allow a single large truck to go through a neighborhood instead of all of these trucks bumping into one another and moving through every neighbor, through all these crowded neighborhoods from, uh, from UPS and FedEx and uh, no longer DHL but Postal Service. I, I think coming together would be a very green solution and, a very and it would be financially very viable too. Um, I think we can incentivize employees in a better way and we can deploy them against the operational model in a more flexible, agile fashion. Um, I like what we're doing with seamless acceptance and the intelligent mail barcode. That's going to allow all, all kinds of benefits for the customers and, and for internal operations. The Postal Service got much better in the last few years on using information and gathering information. The bill. Uh, Gallagher is sort of a national treasurer with regard to the development and understanding of operations that helped us immensely tighten the, the efficiency of the, the operations. And so I'm, I'm pretty hopeful, okay. maybe, not in this, not, maybe not for the same reason. But we have a lot of options. I, I, the, the other thing I loved about uh, Congressman Davis's comment is we do need to listen more. Our customers are very, very bright. And, and sometimes I think we're very guilty of not having listened to them. And, and the people that make the equipment are they're as smart as can be. They, they live by their wits. And, and I think a lot of times we turn them away with, with wonderful ideas. Okay. Uh, Mr. Herr, uh, in, in your testimony, you suggested that uh, beyond the Postal Service's aggressive uh, uh, plan here, uh, that they say is urgently needed uh, for viability. You suggest that that may not indeed be enough, what they've got on the table right now. Mm -hmm. uh, what action do you think is needed here uh, if that is not enough? Well, at this point, they're looking to take $5.9 billion out in costs, and, and as I mentioned earlier, that, that would be unprecedented. And, and so and they're, they've made good progress on it so far this year, but to make sure that that happens without any additional shocks that could come, say, from a fuel increase or something like that. So as we <coughs> mentioned in the state, they need to be sure to think about uh, looking at uh, retail facilities, if there's opportunities to do that. And we specifically mentioned facilities in urban areas rather than small rural post offices. We think that may be an area of places that have multiple options. Uh, other things work with the unions to find ways to to, uh, there have been some real efforts uh, to reduce uh, costs for delivery services, and that's been a, a real breakthrough agreement that they had with one of their unions on that. So there are ways there to, to move forward, too. And I think more broadly, because 80 percent of their costs are compensation and benefits, they need to take a look at what options are there, because that's, that's certainly the largest cost center. Yeah. Uh, and, and given the, the, the transportation costs associated with the post office, we have caught a real break here. Uh, since you know, in the past eight months with the price of, of fuels. So that's been somewhat of a stimulus. Or we've dodged that bullet while we're facing some others. Uh, I'm not sure if the gentleman from Illinois has any questions. Uh, Chair, recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Williams, Mr. Herr, it's good to see you both. Uh, you, Mr. Herr, let me ask you. Uh, the Postal Service is uh, required to pre-fund 80 percent of its future liability for retiree health benefits by 2016. Do you know of any company in the country that is required or chooses to pre-fund on such an accelerated uh, schedule? Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, companies, but I do know in the federal government other agencies, including GAO, pre-fund retiree health care. Uh, benefits and uh, my understanding from talking with our financial folks at GAO is that this is some, the Postal Service was behind in terms of these making these payments and so in a sense this represents an efforts to catch up 
and that's why the num well, one, the number of employees is large, and for that reason, the, the size of the payment is large as well, sir. Um, also, under HR 22, the Postal Service would still be pre-funded on the order of some two billion dollars a year by 2016, a little more than four percent of the unfunded liability per year. Although most private companies do not pre-fund at all, um, do you know any percentage of uh, or companies or what percentage of companies in the private sector that might fund at that level? I'm not aware. Of that. We, we did not look specifically at the private sector. We took a hard look at the numbers the Postal Service had provided to us. Um, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Williams, let me ask you, um, we're obviously looking for all of the cost savings possibilities mm -hmm. that we can p possibly find, hope to find, look to find, if there's anything to find. Um, when you look at the uh, Postal Service's utilization of fuel, um, do you have any comments that you could make relative to uh, what their utilization seem to be? We have recommended to them in the past that they, they engage in the purchase of uh, futures of, um, of fuel, and of course that, that definitely faded into the, uh, the background when the, the, the price of gasoline spiked. As it, as it lowers again, it might be tempting to reconsider the purchase of that. Um, I think as the, as the network is right-sized, there'll be fewer places to drive between and among, and that's going to result in some conservation. The possibilities for alternative fuel and uh, is very exciting. I'd, I'd love to get more involved in it, and I, I, I believe we're going to be meeting with Congressman Serrano on exploring some of those possibilities. Those, are, those, those would be great solutions if the technology is, is mature enough. We have, we've taken a false step in the past with, uh, with ethanol. We bought ethanol, 1,300 trucks, and we don't use ethanol fuel in them. We use regular gasoline because of the availability. So it does pay to look before we leap, but there are some exciting possibilities out there. And, and we've all been excited and delighted um, recently, at least in the last uh, three, four months. But we never quite know what might happen in the future. Right. And just as we've experienced uh, some price reductions, it's also possible that we might be in a situation again where the prices escalate. And I mean, that is a possibility. I, I agree. Thank you very much. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank both of you for your, your great testimony here. Thank you for helping the committee with its work. We'll continue to work on a couple of these issues uh, uh, outside of committee, but uh, outside of hearing. But uh, uh, we, we really appreciate your, your willingness to come here and testify today. Uh, you're free to go and uh, have a good day. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I would like to invite the next panel up just to get you seated. <laughs> this is just worked out really well. Okay. Okay. Right.
welcome, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Goff, Mr. Mapper, Mr. Keating. I appreciate your willingness to come before the committee to help us with his work. Uh, it's the committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in, so I'd like to ask you to please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Mr. Dale Goff is the president of the National Association of Postmasters of the United States. Dale Goff is in his 39th year with the U.S. Postal Service, which began as a postal assistant in New Orleans. He has been a member of the National Association of Postmasters for 29 years. His NAPA positions have included state president, national vice president, national president, among others. He was also Postmaster of the Year in 1994. Mr. Charles Mapper is president of the National League of Postmasters of the United States. Charles Mapper is, the, is a postal and military veteran with 35 years of service. Mr. Mapper has been a member of the National League of Postmasters for 24 years. He has also served as the California branch vice president, exec executive vice president, and president. Mr. Mapper was elected national president in 2006 and re-elected in 2008. Mr. Ted Keating, president, is president of the National Association of Postal Supervisors. Mr. Keating worked for the United States Postal Service for 40 years, following four years with the Air Force. Mr. Keating began his membership of the National Association of Postal Supervisors as a member of the Northeastern Branch, 498. Uh, for 15 years, Mr. Mapp, I'm sorry, Mr. Keating served on the Massachusetts State Executive Board, including nine years in which he held the position of Secretary Treasurer. Mr. Keating was elected to the position of Executive Vice President of the National Association of Postal Supervisors in August 1998. Mr. Keating retired from the U.S. Postal Service in October 2004 and has assumed the presidency of the association in December of 2004. Uh, welcome, gentlemen, and, and Mr. Goff, if you could, we'll welcome your opening statement. Mr. Chairman, my name is Dale Goff. I am president of the 40,000-member National Association of Postmasters of the United States, NAPIS. I am also postmaster of Covington, Louisiana. I represent the managers in charge of the 27,000 independent post offices in this nation. These post offices serve urban, suburban, and rural communities. Some of these post offices support a network of postal stations, community postal units, and contracted postal stations. Other offices are so small that they define a community, employ just a postmaster, and have limited hours of operation. For customers living in isolated towns, a post office is their lifeline to the outside world. During this past summer, a New England postmaster illustrated this point at a PRC hearing on the universal service obligation. The postmaster serves a remote offshore town and is the commercial hub of the island. The post office is the town's pharmacy, since Mayo order drug companies are the primary means of dispensing medications, and the town's bank, since postal money orders are used for commerce. The picture being t painted today is not very pretty. Mail volume is crashing, and so is its associated revenue. Service cuts and work hour reductions are deep and wide. Residential and business customers feel the squeeze as postmasters are being directed to cut window hours close on Saturdays, consolidate delivery routes, defer necessary repairs, and restrict access to mail supplies. Service and safety are being compromised. These actions are the result of factors that are beyond the control of the agency. The economic contraction has swallowed up mail volume and revenue. My fear is that too short a financial lifeline is fool's gold. As frontline managers, postmasters are highly qualified to offer input with regard to the financial instability of the Postal Service and long-term strategies for streamlining its operations. First and foremost, it is crucial that the committee report favorably H.R. 22, bipartisan legislation to provide the Postal Service and its customers a temporary financial lifeline. This measure permits the Postal Service to accelerate the effective date of using the Postal Retirees Health Benefit Trust Fund to pay current retiree premiums. It amortizes the remaining fund liability to a more attainable period of time. This proposal is neither a bailout nor does it cost U.S. taxpayers a dime. H.R. 22 is fair, 
responsible, and helps protect the universal postal service. It is imperative to note that the crisis plaguing the postal service is beyond its control and a fiscal climate exists that Congress did not envision when the postal reform law was enacted. Now the tools with which Congress equipped the postal service and the associated fiscal requirements are problematic. Postmasters are troubled by budget analysis which theorizes mm -hmm. that temporary postal relief would undermine efficient business practices and aggressive cost cutting. Mr. Chairman, extinction of universal postal service would be the product without passage of postal relief legislation. In the absence of such legislation, Postal Doomsday, Doomsday falls on Wednesday, September 30th, 2009. On that date, the Postal Service will no longer be able to perform its constitutional duties on behalf of our country. 8% of this nation's gross domestic product is tied to the Postal Service, so failing to respond to this crisis is not an option. The administration can help to alleviate this crisis. The Office of Personnel Management has the authority to more accurately recompute the 2002 estimate of the USPS projected overpayment into the Civil Service Retirement Trust Fund. The calculation made by the previous administration was significantly understated the, over, the overpayment. The Postal Service can help itself. Clearly, the immense postal bureaucracy contributes to in inefficiencies and costs. In 2003, NAPIS testified before the President's Commission on the U.S. Postal Service about the ne necessity to delayer the bureaucracy. Last Friday, the Postal Service took a step in the right direction, but fell short of this mark. Fortuitously, last week I glanced through the manuscript of a 1951 hearing before the House Post Office and Civil Service Committee. The hearing records, record relates that Hoover, the Hoover Report on Government Reorganization provided for the decentralization of the Postal Service into 15 regions, enabling closer supervision of the more than 40,000 post offices. Mr. Chairman, today we have 13,000 fewer offices than in 1951, yet the Postal Service finances about six times as many districts as proposed in the Hoover Report. Mr. Goff, you've exceeded the, the time limit. Uh, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to let you finish your statement when I come back. Okay, I know you've got a few more pages there. I'm reading along with you. Uh, but uh, I've got a vote on the floor, and I, I cannot miss it. Okay? Yes, Actually, sir. I've got uh, Yeah, I've got two or three votes, and uh, these will be the last votes for the day, so we'll be able to finish up when I come back. Okay? Thank you. And, again, I apologize.